Hello, everybody. Randy Patterson here with Boomerosity. If you're a baby boomer and you got to be, if you're dialing into this site, <laughs> you no doubt have heard of the band Poco. And there have been some great guys that have been involved with that band over the years. And a handful of them have formed a new band called Cimarron 615. Now, there's significance behind that name, and you will need to watch this interview to see what it is. But these guys are phenomenal musicians. I've heard the album. It's phenomenal. And if you like country rock, if you like bands like Poco and like Pure Prairie League, uh, the, the Flying Burrito Brothers, you're going to hear those kinds of sound and more. It's going to sound like an old classic album but it's brand new music so if you love that kind of music like i do then you definitely want to hear this album and you definitely want to watch this interview so without any further ado this is randy patterson with boomerosity until next time take care well guys thanks a million for joining this call today i uh you know when i heard the album i was like oh my gosh this this is good stuff this takes me back um it sounds classic, even though it's brand new stuff. And so I'm I'm thrilled to be able to talk to you guys about this whole thing. Um, with the background that each of you have, I mean, you bring such a a, a depth and a breadth of of um, incredible music and incredible experience. And I think fans are going to eat this stuff up. I I know I am. So uh, if, if you guys don't mind, tell me a little bit about each of yourselves. Um, let's start with Tom and. Uh, let let uh, new listeners and fans alike hear your story very briefly, and then we'll get in about the band itself and the uh, the new album. Well, I'm I'm the 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 last man to the table here. I was the last guy to join Poco uh, to be part of that that club. But I've just been a a journeyman side man. I've dabbled in releasing my own stuff over the years here and there. But you know, like most of us, we're all lifers. So you know, I just kind of jumped into this at an early age and and you know, good things have happened over the years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bill, how about you? I came to Nashville in uh, 82 and got a publishing deal and uh, ended up teaming up with Radney Foster at, when we were both staff songwriters and we had uh, records on RCA and got to travel the world and have fun with that. And uh, I met Rusty Young in 1989 or 90s, no, 89 maybe. Mm -hmm. And uh, we wrote some songs together that were on Poco Records. And uh, that's my association with Poco. I got to fill in some spots for Paul over the years and then uh, have some songs on there and played on them. But uh, the Sky Kings was the band we had in the 90s where I, where I worked with Rusty. And uh, that's my kind of entree into this club. Very cool. folks. Very yeah. cool. Jack, how about you? Well, um, I moved to Nashville in 1981 and uh, started playing on the road with different people. Um, Gail Davies was my very first gig and played with Dickie Betts and Vince Gill and a bunch of others and, and auditioned for Poco in 1985 and uh, worked with them until the original band got back together and uh, I went off in the 90s. I was a staff writer and I was in a band called Great Plains for a few years. And then uh, I rejoined Poco in 2000 and was with them the duration. Now, all of you except Tom are in Nashville. Is that correct, Tom? You're up in Pennsylvania, correct? No, we're we're all in Nashville. Oh, Everybody. okay. Yeah. Okay. I thought you were in, in Pennsylvania. So well, I lived in Philadelphia for a lot of years. I moved but I'm a I'm a native Tennessean. I moved back to Nashville in 2013, 2014, somewhere. I around see, there. I see. Well, the, the that little town has changed just a little bit, hasn't it? <laughs> it's changed since the call started, Randy. I, yeah. I mean, that's kind of the way it is now. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's. Uh, I know. I was down there. I was working downtown, and then the pandemic hit and sent everybody home. So I come back to Sevierville. I went back about six months later, and I thought, well, somebody forgot to tell the construction crews there was a shutdown. I mean, the, those high rises mm -hmm. and such. I mean, it, it blows me away every time I go back there for a visit. So um, I'm sure you guys can remember 
a lot, a, a, when it was a lot smaller town than it is now and a lot less developed. Not long after I moved to town, I went with Jack and Russ Paul over to the station Inn to see the Doyle and Debbie show. And we were standing in the parking lot talking afterward. And this was, again, this was 2015, 2016. This was a while back. Um, Jack was saying that when he first moved to town, that there wasn't a single multiple story building within the line of sight from where we were standing wow. that night. And it is nothing like that now. Nosebleed high buildings. That is for sure. I, I remember when the tornado hit in early 20, late 2019 or whatever, that uh, construction crane cr cam that caught the tornado coming around near downtown. That was mm -hmm. That was scary to watch, and I, I was over in the Sylvan Park area, so it was um, it, it got close enough for me for too much too close for comfort. But uh, mm -hmm. but enough enough about that. Let's talk about this phenomenal band you guys have put together. I yeah, uh, you missed out on Rick. Oh, we missed out on Rick. Oh, that, that, that's oh, fine with me. I'm sorry. I am so sorry, Rick. Please, my my bad. Well, I I, I came to Nashville in '88, and. Uh, I, the, the first thing, as far as connecting to this band, I'd left when I came here in 88, I'd left the employee of the Bellamy Brothers. I'd been out mm -hmm. with them for about three and a half years. Uh, very great job. Really great opportunity to work with those guys. Really kind of got me more feet into the country rock and the California country rock style. Uh, and then I, I had an old friend from Palmdale, California, where I'm from, uh, uh, named Ronnie Gilbo. And his dad was in the Flying Burrito Brothers. When I came to town, he was working an MCA record deal with a group they just called the Burrito Brothers. I started drumming for that band. Uh, I was them with them until that deal broke up. And then uh, uh, while I was with the Bellamy Brothers, Ronnie and I started writing songs and and we wrote the song Call It Love while I was still in the employee with the Bellamy Brothers. And then when, uh, when I left then, it was just about the time that Poco got that offer to go back with RCA with the original lineup that Jack just mentioned a moment ago. And, uh, and, and they took our song and, and, and uh, Rusty sang call it love and they made a hit record out of it. So uh, that just kind of launched a, you know, I, it's still for me, that didn't connect me straight to Poco other than as a songwriter. And then uh, Ronnie's dad, Gib got together with sneaky Pete Kleino. And then we created another version of the flying burrito brothers and started doing Europe and, doing stuff that that name will just kind of get you around the map pretty well. Uh, so I did that for a bunch of years. Ronnie and I had our own band. We tried to get a record deal, but the, the most success we had was getting that song cut with, with Poco. And uh, I guess a year, so, you know, I, I kind of just kind of fell into the session drumming here in Nashville and playing with the, the Jamie Hartford band, a bunch of other cool bands that are from Nashville. But my living was basically here in town. Uh, until not the maybe five, six years ago, Rusty Young called me to see if I'd like to join Poco. And, uh, of course I would like to join Poco and did join Poco. And so I was in that final version of the band up until Rusty passed away. I was with the band then. And this band of course is an offshoot of that time period. Right. Right. Well, I find that it refreshing. I'm sure you guys do too, for obvious reasons that your, your sound is enjoying such a you know great reception from fans that young and old alike you know us old timers that that remember it when it was brand new you know and poco was a new name and that type of thing and then all the young ones that are coming up thinking they're inventing it right so <laughs> for you guys to put this band together and like i said i've heard the album a couple of times and absolutely love it um I just think it's brilliant. I, I I sense that you guys are going to enjoy great success about it. But tell me what drove you guys to to do this to 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 recreate something that you've always enjoyed doing, just yet in another incarnation, if you will. Anybody want that one? Somebody take. take go ahead. I'm talking to Mike right now. He's trying to get on the Zoom call. I just texted him back too. I think you might need the link again. Um, well, when Rusty passed away, we all kind of thought that, you know, that was the end of an era and that, you know, this would, you know, this would go the, the this would die with Rusty. And we, uh, we agreed to go out to California at the behest of the, the guy who runs the label that Rusty's solo record came out on in 2017. 
uh, he invited us out to play a, a live concert taping, kind of being the house band for uh, kind of a Rusty Young tribute show. And we went out and did that. We did a couple of days of rehearsals, went out and rehearsed, filmed the show. Uh, then we did a day in the studio uh, and recorded four or five songs for the, the Rusty Young tribute record that came out a year or so ago. And as we were getting onto the shuttle to go back to the airport to fly back to Nashville, Kirk texted us and offered us a record deal. So he saw something in this conglomeration of, of guys and the chemistry that comes of that, that uh, yeah, he wanted to see this continue. And it's in a, in a sense, it's kind of, it's like rock and roll history repeating itself because you know when Springfield folded, you know, Jimmy and Richie and Rusty kind of found themselves in the same boat of creating something out of something that had fallen by the wayside. And, and, and here we're doing the same thing half a century later. But I think to most of our years, there's a lot more ingredients in this stew than just the, the Poco lineage, because in listening to that record, there's, the, you know, you can hear a little traces of American Beauty and, and music from Big Pink and Damn the Torpedoes. There's, there's a bunch of stuff in there that, that you wouldn't necessarily trace to that lineage, I don't think. Right. Well, it's, if, as a fan, and I'm a non-musician, I, I don't even play air guitar good, but when I, I do feel like I have a sense of things when I'm listening to a record, and it seems to me in, in, with this debut album that there is a, a, a bonding between you guys. Let's see, there's Mike, let me admit him, um, that there's a bonding, a, a bond between you guys and a really tight camaraderie that a brotherhood, if you will, is that, am I describing that feeling accurately or am I getting it all wrong there? <laughs> no, I think, I think you hit the nail on the head. You know, the, the thing that people may not see from behind the scenes is it's, it's chemistry is what makes bands work. And I think the reason that we're all here now is that Kirk recognized that chemistry that you're mentioning it's just, uh, it's kind of unexplainable. I couldn't tell you exactly why we would all fit together. Uh, I didn't know all five of these guys real well. I, I knew uh, I knew three of them really well. Uh, and yet, Kirk saw it, and it's true. It's true. When we're together, it's a whole lot of cutting up. It's a whole lot of goofing off, and uh, and these are good friends. Everyone seems to, to truly enjoy each other's company. And then add to that, everyone seems to be uh, immensely talented. It certainly comes across that way. What, um, what do you guys attribute? I mean, you've watched this thing from the beginning, right? Right when all the original bands were coming together and such. Seeing this, I, I hate to call it a resurgence because I feel like the, there's always been a demand for your kind of sound, whether it's Eagles or Poco or whoever. You know, now they want to slap the Americana label and put a bunch of different sounds into that but to me it seems like there's always been a a, a market and a, a a um desire to hear your kind of sound what is it about that do you guys feel makes that so crickets <laughs> go, go, go. Uh, hard to answer that's a loaded question I, you know, uh, I think, you know, in terms of the sound, uh, I, I, I think we all share a lot of the same record collections, you know, we, and we all, I think we all were into Poco before any of us had any sort of uh, kind of rel relationship there, you know, I mean, I saw them in the, a couple times in the early 70s, way before I met Rusty, and I think the other guys too, I, I believe. Uh, so I, I think the combination of history of all of us, the sounds and the kind of experiences we've had is a uh, kind of makes it what it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about you, Jack? What do you think? Um, <clears throat> well, I think uh, being in Nashville here, I think country music kind of took a turn away from me anyway. I think away from all of us, uh, the kind of music that we really wanted to make. I think this music is, has always been going on, but it's been harder to find. And I think it was we were we were all kind of happy to have the opportunity to, to get together and be given support to to release a record of this kind of music. I mean, that really was affirming, you know. Yeah. Very cool, Mike. Um, I did, I, oh, I found it. 
<laughs> ah, there you are. Hey, Michael. Hey, Mike, Mike, I know we don't know each other, but these guys were ganging up on you. I tried to defend you as best I could, and you can you can have your rebuttals later, okay? <laughs> you got it. <laughs> so, Mike, I, I gave the other guys a chance. Uh, tell people a little bit about yourselves. This is being recorded, so you know if 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 you um, you know say anything derogatory about the other guys, I can edit it out or or magnify it, whichever you wish. So, <laughs> uh, what what are we uh, what are we what are you wanting to know? Well, just a little bit about yourself, and now we're talking about the, the sound of the band, and then we'll get into the album after that. Uh uh, well, I I came to Nashville uh, late '80s and uh, started uh, uh, playing and recording right off the bat, and uh, found myself in just drawn to the world that's now uh, called Americana. It wasn't even called that yet, but it seemed to be uh, where my niche was. I didn't even know it existed yet. No one did really, and uh, just through the years, played on a lot of the albums and with a lot of the artists that are. Uh, kind of mainstays of country rock and alternative country, roots rock, whatever you want to call it. And uh, one thing led to another. And uh, in the early 2000s, uh, a mutual friend of ours called me asking about uh, finding someone to play with Poco. And uh, Paul Cotton had just left. So uh, as we talked about it, it just wound up uh, becoming uh, the obvious thing for me to come in. And I'd already done so many projects with Rick Lano over the years, all through the 90s, just all kinds of recordings and writing and playing live and and, and being part of the scene that <clears throat> we already had all these uh, tangential relationships to this music through various uh fixtures on the scene like Soup Granda from those Ark Mountain Daredevils and Walter Egan, who was who uh, wrote with Graham Parsons. And uh, they were in a, a band that was an offshoot of the Burrito Brothers called Burrito Deluxe. And I was in an offshoot called Brooklyn Cowboys that had Buddy Cage from New Riders. And we were just all kind of in this world any way it existed all through the 90s and 2000s. So when... Uh, Jack came over, Jack Sundred, and we started getting ready for Poco. It, it was just a kind of a natural evolution for me personally. And then uh, playing with Rusty it just felt like a natural fit that, as if we'd been in each other's lives forever. And then uh, that continued for many years uh, to the point to where uh, here we are now. Simmer on 615, and I've known all these guys uh, the whole time. Bill Lloyd's been part of the Nashville scene since, you know, my entire time I've ever lived here. I grew up in Kentucky. He's from Kentucky, so I've heard his name uh, forever. So it seems like uh, we've, we were just kind of destined to be here at this point in time. Very cool. How's that? <laughs> perfect, perfect. So tell me, before we get right into the album itself, tell me what's the significance of the name of the band? Michael. Oh, <laughs> well, we tried several names, but the, uh, uh, the that one was, uh, you know, the we we were all here because of Rusty Young, and one of his signature songs if, is "Rose of Cimarron," and we felt that that was a an, an honest nod to Rusty. And then, of course, we all live here in Nashville, and there he could six one five and. It just seemed to click with everybody, so we went with that. Interesting. I knew there had to be Not something to say, very we didn't agonize over for a couple of weeks. We came up with some doozies, but <laughs> yeah. uh, there's there's a show that we play in the summer in Wisconsin for a really good friend of Michael's, and um, Jack and I rode back the whole way, and we were literally just picking out phrases off billboards and whatever would pop up in our heads. I was driving, and Jack was riding shotgun. So as he would say, "What kind of band do you think?" you know, the name of the town that we just drove by is. He would Google it and it would turn out that name was already taken by uh, a, a surf punk band in Wichita, Kansas or <laughs> something like that. It, it was a process, but I, I think everybody in the band really likes where we landed. Yeah. I think I think it's very nice. What's the 
especially now that I know the story behind it, but you guys have each referenced the influences here. How did you wrestle with, as you were putting these songs together, did you find it hard to like try to stay away from something that sounds like it's a knockoff versus, I mean, I don't hear any knockoffs in there. I definitely hear influences, but I don't hear anything that sounds too close to something else. I mean, was that something that came natural or did you have to work really hard at that? Because either way, it's great. <laughs> well, thanks. I'd like to say that I think we all served the songs. All of us did. We, we listened to what the song was doing and, and, and to try to serve that as best as we could. You know, how the song structure works, the lyric, everything. Mm -hmm. Is well, that fair, y'all? Yeah. And we, I mean, we, we, we know what our, uh, uh, some of the things, like, <clears throat> we, we would work up the songs in an honest fashion. And then uh, always knowing that the attention to those harmonies is is key to our, our lineage and our legacy and the the genre we're a part of. So we didn't really imitate anything, but we did kind of uh, use the our experiences in in the to to work hard to make the songs fully realized. But we didn't overtly copy Poco or overtly copy the eagles or anything like that ever right well it, and again it doesn't sound like you have uh, and again i'm not a songwriter but i <clears throat> can kind of imagine and empathize what it takes to write a song and how you guys well, like i said it sounds classic and yet it's brand new and that's what's refreshing about it all <laughs> And um, again, why I think it's going to do very well. How how long from conception to finished product did it take you guys to put this album together? Well, took uh, it was less than a year. It, you know, there's so many things that come into that. It, there's there's clerical things and 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 contractual things that slow it down. I think artistically, we probably had the vision the day we are, were offered the record deal. I. I know the two songs I brought it, I'd already had, they were written and uh, the first single, uh, High Lonesome Stranger, I wrote that back in the 90s. Uh, I just knew this was the kind of band that was supposed to record that song. We just needed the band to exist so we could record it. <laughs> uh, uh, so as far as conceptualizing on the musical end, we probably, all of us were ready to go the, you know, the, the minute that we heard we had a record deal. But then there's a whole lot of stuff, booking the studio. I actually, uh, I, I, while doing a little garden project, I, I fractured the femur in my leg. And I, it, put, it put our recording schedule back about uh, a month or six weeks. Pardon the jet flying overhead. <laughs> but you know what? That turned out to be a blessing because uh, we didn't really know what we were. We thought we had the next batch of songs ready to go. And yep. <clears throat> To be honest, one of the songs that uh, we were kind of toying around uh, with Tom's, if there was going to be anything that maybe perhaps sounded to Bertley Poco, <clears throat> it, it, that one was maybe going to be it. And he and I went and while we were killing time, while Rick was healing up, played a show just the two of us. And and in learning Tom's song, Try, Try Again, we played that just the two of us and realize like, Oh, that's got to be the one that goes on the album. And not only is it on the album, it's kind of the source of the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the title because brand new distance <laughs> is in there, the whole arrangement. And, uh, so if Rick hadn't done that, that probably wouldn't have happened. So there's always a silver lining. <clears throat> so to me that, that, that it, it seemed like a setback at first. And then, you know, we got one of our signature songs on the yeah, album. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Cool. I don't know who gets credit for it. I don't know if anybody's taken credit for it. I think Kirk might have tried to take credit for it at one point. But <laughs> it was decided early on that we were all going to bring two songs each in. And I, I, I think, Michael, I think it was you that initially said, you know, when we book the studio time, we're going to book five days. Everybody gets a day for song. Yeah. And when we did that, everybody came in with a single song. And we so after that first week of sessions, 
there, there, it was real clear what what the record sounded like, what it was going to sound like, what our identity was going to be. That other song that I was going to bring in would not have fit on this record. The song, the song that I ended up bringing in did fit on this record. So having that having that preview of knowing what those first five songs were going to sound like made it easier to pick a song to bring in for the second set of sessions to finish the record. That's one of the reasons I think the record holds together as well as it does is because you know, when you've already got an idea of how the record is starting to, to shape up, that, that enables you to have a tighter focus about what to bring. Yeah. Huh. Well, you guys are seasoned. I mean, you guys have played on a lot of records, played on a lot of stages, <laughs> and probably not much gets by you or surprises you. But I'm just curious, in putting this album together, were there any surprises that you guys weren't anticipating, good or bad? It all well, ran pretty smooth, from in my opinion. Yeah. After, again, like Tom said, after the first half, we kind of knew like little things that always happen. Like, well, we can't have two mid tempos or da da da. What just overall view? But I, I don't recall anything really being a big curveball. It was surprising to me how good. I mean, the record it, it stands on its own. I don't know if I knew we'd be able to to stack the vocals and make the vocals sound as great as, as we did that really uh, as, as the process started, we, we knew we we're singers and it, this is going to be a singing band, but golly, it really got enormous and beautiful as, as we did went down on, uh, on the recording. I, I remember when we went in, when we went into the studio in, in Los Angeles, we hadn't really worked together in the studio before. Some of us had some, you know, but not as a, as a group. And I really felt like we went in there that the day of that session, just kind of feeling each other out. And by the end of the day, we had really gelled just in that one that's day. That's a good point, Jack. Yeah, that's a good point. That was on the Rusty Young Tribute record, Randy. Yes. Yeah. How about you, Tom? Well, yeah. I was listening to them talk about the vocals. There's a, yeah, you know, I'm a bit of a, of a documentary addict and, and there's a documentary about the band Kansas where they're talking about when they were making their first record mm -hmm. and how none of them had really gotten an opportunity to hear Steve Walsh sing yet until they went into the studio. Because when you're playing on stage or when you're rehearsing or whatever, you know, you get focused on working out parts and stuff like that. When you're in a listening environment in a studio, listening to what's been tracked and when it all comes back to you, you're, you're kind of hearing it for the first time in its full, you know, in its fully realized form then. And just like they were saying, just going in and, and working out these songs and coming up with the vocal parts and hearing all that come together, that, that was probably my favorite part of the process. Cool. So I know I learned years ago when I launched this project that called Boom Rossi that you never ask an artist what their favorite song is on an album, whether they wrote it or not, because it's like asking them who their favorite kid is. And we're not really supposed to be doing that kind of thing. But but I do I, I have learned to ask a different kind of question that gets to the same kind of point, more or less. And that is which song from this project would each of you point to as a calling card? It says, hey, y'all, if you like this song, you're really going to love the rest of the album. And, and Rick, I'll start with you. Ugh, boy, that is a rough one. I mean, I do like the choice. <laughs> I do like the choice Kirk made of, of showing off our vocals with the High Lonesome Stranger because it's the very first thing that you hear is a cappella. You hear us sing. And uh, so I like that because it, it does establish this is going to be a singing band. You're you're going to hear guys that are concentrating on making harmonies. And, and they're solos. And it's, it's, it's pretty much a perfect calling card. It's, it's, every a, it's a great it's first a, choice because of uh, everybody got to sing uh, lines on that song. It features everybody as a lead vocalist. That's a good point, too, Bill. Yeah, that's right. How about you, Tom? Um, if I had to, if I had to hand somebody the CD and, and they asked which track to put on first, uh, I would probably point them to high just because there's an energy there. And then there's the, the dual guitar thing. And like everybody, again, it's one of those things where everybody's represented. Um, I, I just really like the energy of that song. 
cool. Jack, I hadn't heard your input. What What do you think? Well, I'm I'm on the uh, High Lonesome Stranger train as well. I just think that that's a really good kind of a global, uh, you know, look at the band. And you know, like Bill said, all of us get to sing some. The playing the the solos is cool. The sound is great. It's it's just a it's like a timeless piece of music. Agreed. Agreed. What kind of response are your friends telling you and and fans that are getting exposed now? Um, what are you hearing back from everybody about the album? Oh, they love it. They love yeah. it. Not surprising. You know, a lot of our fans are the Poco Nuts that remain our fans, even though the, the now that the band is broken up, now the Poco is broken up, they're excited to know what what they were wondering what we were going to do anyway, and now that we are doing something together, uh, they are they really like Cimarron Six One Five. I think we're fitting what they were hoping they were hoping we might go something like this. Very cool. How about you, Bill? What are you hearing? Lot, nothing but good things, really. Uh, it's been uh, a lot of a lot of lovely compliments and and. Uh, you know, just, you know, gives us a little hope that this thing has some legs and we can move forward. Tom, what are you hearing? Um, lots of emails showing up from the, the, the website. Uh, when are you guys going to play in Pine Bluff, Arkansas? And when are you going to play in Helena, Montana? And when are you going to, uh, people really want to see this band get on the road, myself included. I, I think that, you know, we've played a couple of shows here and there, but we haven't really gotten to get our live thing together the way that I think we, we haven't reached our potential yet. And when we do, I think it's going to be impressive. Have you heard any feedback from from former band members and such? And and as far as the sound, as far as the the quality of the songs, you guys, all that kind of thing. You hear anything say like from Richie or you know anybody like that? Rich, uh... Richie's texted and said, congratulations and well done. That was mainly over the video, <clears throat> mm -hmm. the video for How Lonesome Stranger. They got a lot of people's attention right off the bat. So, yeah, Richie himself and several others, you know, that are in there. Jeff Hanna, mm -hmm. our old buddy Sue from those Ark Mountain yeah, Daredevil. Yeah, up, yep, yep. Well, Richie's, a, I don't know the other guys, but Richie, I, I've interviewed a, a few times, class act all the way. Very, you know, very yeah, gracious. Good guy. Seems, good guy. From my perspective, at least. But um, so what's on the radar? What do you guys got on, on your agenda, your itinerary for the rest of the year? What do you, or what do you hope to see happen for the rest of the year? Touring. Yeah. <laughs> there, there is a fair amount on our plate. We, we, we're, uh, We've got another video in the can. We're we're expected to release yet a third video, and so we're, we'll be working on that. We have work here in Nashville this month. Uh, we have work up Wisconsin next month. Um, it's starting to roll. It's our, we'll, we'll we'll people will start seeing us. We will start popping up. We've got something cooking over in St. Louis. I think we've got a, a few things, but business wise, we're we're even probably going to start the uh, next album maybe by summer's end or sometime not not too far in the future just depending on the touring schedule but there's a lot on our plate it seems very cool very cool well, i yeah, um, just I, brought an agent on pardon so, me uh, we just brought an agent on so we've all got our fingers crossed for him but you know it's one of those things where you know he, he's not going to be able to get us work next week because everybody's booked for next week next month you know, that's that that ball's going to take a minute to get rolling. So we've got other stuff on our plate to keep us busy until then. But um, by, you know, by fall, uh, hopefully we'll be looking at, a, you know, a, a lot of check marks on the calendar. Very good. Well, I know I'll be keeping an eye on your site. And uh, hopefully if you don't get near my neck of the woods, I'll be near y'all's. I'm over in Sevierville up in the Smokies. So maybe you guys oh, will play a, right on. Maybe you'll play a gig in Knoxville or Chattanooga I'm going to be in Knoxville this weekend. Where for at? Kim Web uh, for Kim Weber's memorial? Did you know Kim Weber? No, I didn't. She's a uh, book down here in Nashville. They're having her celebration of life. Oh, I didn't realize that. I didn't realize that. Do you There's... know Brian Walschlager? I recognize the name, but I don't know. Him. But um, 
there's there's a few here i know most of my contacts seem to be farther away from me than closer yep. so <laughs> it's kind of like uh getting away from the mississippi depends on whether your tea is sweet or unsweet you know <laughs> the, the farther away it's either getting sweeter or more unsweet so uh, and here it's sweet and in arizona where i grew up it's very much unsweet so um but anyway yeah i i uh most of my contacts are out west and up in new york but man guys this is i i'm i know that a few years down the road, I'm going to be able to point to this interview and say, I got to talk to these guys before y'all knew about them. And uh, there'll be some bragging rights for me, but I love your sound. I love your vibe, how you guys come across. I, I feel the camaraderie there. And that's what I, I love almost as much as the music when a band really gets together. When you know there's infighting, you know, you feel like a cop being called to a domestic violence thing and you, you don't know if you're going to get shot or not, you know, but uh but you guys, I love everything about you. I look forward to hearing more. My door is always going to be open to you. And I hope I get to catch a, a gig and maybe even sneak backstage and bump elbows with you to say hello and get you to sign something for me or something. So um, thank you, Randy. Thank you. Thanks a million. Please let me know if there's anything I can do to help. And of course, we can always do one of these to get word out on whatever you have going on. Okay. Uh, uh, we do have a gig coming up at the end of the month in this area down in Leapers Fork at Fox and Lock. If you happen to find yourself over this way, what date is May, that? May 31st. I might be able to, to work that out. Okay. Oh, very please. Cool. Yeah, please come to that. That, that. That's a very cool venue. We'd be glad to meet you there. All uh -oh. right, I, I'm just going to cut off on that. I'll drop you guys a note, so we'll do that. But guys, thanks Hello. a million, and uh, stay safe, stay well. Um, Tom, if you come up with a guitar or two missing, I promise I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> and you thanks, probably won't Randy. even notice it missing. So, <laughs> well, listen, you guys take care, and uh, I'll see you down the road. Okay. We appreciate you. Right, take day. care. Bye bye. See you guys. This show was edited and produced by Mike McClellan. The original music, Roll the Dice, was written and produced by Quentin Hope. And Randy Patterson was your host and executive producer.